Amen. All right, focus with me here in chapter number 13 of 1 Samuel, specifically on verse number 14. Verse number 14 says this. <clears throat> of course, this is Samuel speaking to Saul first. But verse number 14. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. And then Samuel says this. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be a captain over his people. Because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. The title of the sermon this, more, or this evening is... The heart of David. The heart of David. So I'm going to giving, be giving you four points specifically about the heart of David. We're told here a very interesting statement. I want you to go to Acts chapter number 13 in the New Testament. We're told a very interesting statement about David and about his heart, if you will. Referring to his will, the things that he desires, his mind. The Bible tells us that David, of course we know that David is the man that replaced Saul. The man that's going to be the captain after Saul over the people, as is pronounced here. We're told that David is a man after God's own heart. The next man that God selects, the man that is going to replace Saul, is going to be a man that is after God's own heart. Now here in... <clears throat> Acts chapter number 13, excuse me, Acts chapter number 13, we're actually given the definition of what God means when he says that David is a man after God's own heart. Look at Acts chapter number 13, I want you to look with me at verse number 22, the Bible says this, and when he had removed him, that's referring to Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king. To whom also he gave testimony, talking about the Lord gave this testimony of David, and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, watch this, a man after mine own heart, and then we're given this other statement, which shall fulfill all my will. So the definition of uh, the statement that God makes about David and describes him as being a man after his own heart is a man after his own will. He's a man that desires the things of God. He's a man that wants to fulfill the will of God. He loves the things of God and he desires the, the same things that God desires. Now, of course, David is a sinner. David's sin, David, of course, has the grievous sin with Bathsheba. And there are a lot of things when it comes to David as being an example that we should not follow. But David, as far as a full example that we have of anyone in the Bible, and then I'm uh, you know, excluding John the Baptist and Jesus, of course, because we don't know much about John the Baptist. But as far as a full example, you know, a man where there's many stories told, I mean, we can learn and read a lot about all of these different men in the Bible, David is by far the greatest example. David is by far the greatest example. So if we wanted to please God, and if we wanted to be a man, after God's own heart, which, which everyone in here should desire to be that. Everyone in here should desire to be a man or a woman after God's own heart. What we can do is we can look at the heart of David. And as I said, that's the title of the sermon this evening, The Heart of David. We can look at the heart of David and some of the, some of the qualities and characteristics of David that set him apart from, let's say, Saul, that set him apart from other kings, that set him apart from other prophets and other men of God, that he would earn the title to be a man after God's own heart, that he would earn the title to be a man when God looks down and says, that's a man that's, that lives after my will. That's a man that wants and desires the same things that I want and I desire, a man that truly puts God first and strives to please God. David was very pleasing in God's eyes. David uh, was, uh, was a man that was exalted by God and given many things. Of course, as I said, yes, he had shortcomings and sins that he committed, but there are, like I'm going to give you tonight, four specific qualities that David has that I believe set him apart in a, in, a, in a major way than many other men of God, many other great men of God. The very first one is his great humility. Now, other men had humility, but not so much as David. I want you to go to 1 Samuel chapter number 18. 1 Samuel chapter number 18. So we're going to spend most of our time in the Old Testament. 1 Samuel chapter number 18. 1 Samuel chapter number 18. This is after David is now, uh, um, you know, working in the kingdom. He's, he's basically on staff. He's under Saul. He's, he's leading the people in and out. The Bible refers to that. So he's the captain at this time, but not, of course, the king. But he's uh, basically the captain of the host under Saul. <clears throat> and uh, I want you to look with me at verse number 22. Let's look at uh, chapter number 
18, verse number 22. Get there myself. Chapter number 18, verse number 22. The Bible says, And Saul commanded his servants, saying, Commune with David secretly, and say, Behold, the king hath delight in thee, and all his servants love thee. Now, therefore, be the king's son-in-law. And Saul's servants spake those words in the ears of David. Now watch this. Watch how David responds. And David said, Seemeth it to you a light thing, like not a big deal, to be a king's son-in-law? Seeing that I am a poor man and lightly esteemed. Verse number 24. And the servants of Saul told him, saying, on this manner spake David. So I want you to notice how David viewed himself. Now what's very interesting about this passage is he says there at the end of verse number 23, he says that I am a poor man and lightly esteemed. Now if we look at the context of this chapter, I want you to back up to verse number... Verse number 6, it says this, And it came to pass as they came when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the woman came out of all the cities of Israel singing, the women, I'm sorry, came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, with instruments of music. And the woman, women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? Now I want you to notice just verses before this, and this is obviously the same you know, time and context of when this uh, happens, when the, the, the servants come and approach him, and they're sent by Saul to con try to conspire to get him to, to marry uh, you know, uh, my cow. Now, in this passage, we're actually given an example of how the, the people in the kingdom, how the children of Israel viewed David. Now, and it doesn't sound like, according to that passage, that David was lightly esteemed. I mean, he is being exalted above, above the king within the kingdom. He's being lifted up above even the king. But when someone comes to him and says, hey, you know, how about being the son-in-law the, the son to the king? How does David view that? He, of course, answers with great humility. He responds and he's basically saying, like, I'm not worthy to be the king's son-in-law. Look at me. And he says, I am but a poor man. And then he also says this, and lightly esteemed. Now, was it true that David was lightly esteemed? Was that true? I mean, the, the, like I said, they're exalting him above the king. They're saying, hey, Saul has slain his thousands, but David is ten thousands. This is what the people of Israel... David was not lightly esteemed. But do you know how David viewed David? David was lightly esteemed in his own eyes. David was able, even through this, to retain a humble heart. David still looked at himself and did not lift himself up, even though within the nation of Israel, David was esteemed highly. David still, in his own eyes, viewed himself as being a poor man and being lightly esteemed. So you can see the, the inside of David's heart there because it doesn't even really match reality, does it? So what he's telling you is how he feels. And he's, he's saying, I'm not worthy to be in a position like that. I'm not worthy to be the son-in-law to the king. Look at me. So he's basically telling you, look at me. What am I? I'm a poor man. I'm lightly esteemed. So you see the great humility of David, surpassing that of many of, uh, of the great men of God that had great humility. I want you to go to... First Chronicles, this is much later in David's life. We'll see that this continued on. David retained humility throughout his life, much of his life. Of course, he had downfalls and did things that he shouldn't have done, as I said. Um, but, of course, he also finished his course. He finished his race as well. Look at First Chronicles chapter 17. I want you to look at verse number 16. And David the king came and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is mine house that thou hast brought me hitherto? And yet this was a small thing in thine eyes, O God, for thou hast also spoken of thy servant's house for a great while to come, and hast regarded me according to the estate of a man of high degree. I want you to notice that, O Lord God. What can David speak more to thee for the honor of thy servant? For thou knowest thy servant. O Lord, for thy servant's sake and according to thine own heart hast thou done all this greatness in making known all these great things. This is towards, more towards the end of David's life. 
And you can still see how David looks at himself. You have David praying a private prayer that's recorded for us here. So this is again, how does David view himself? How does David look at himself? Oftentimes, you know, uh, uh, the way that people act, you're not always able to tell whether they're a proud man, whether they're a humble man. Sometimes it's obvious, but not all the time is it obvious. And you can see here that David was a very humble man, that David retained his humility. And he says, he even talks about himself here, and he talks about him being of low degree. He says, has regarded me according to the estate of a man of high degree. Let me translate that for you. I'm of low degree, but you're regarding me, you're viewing me as a man of high degree. Notice how he views himself in a different way. He's saying, I'm not worthy of everything that you've given to me. I'm not worthy of the life. And he's basically at this time, what's going on is he's looking around at all the things that God has given to him. And he's saying, I'm not worthy of this. This is not, you know, uh, something that I'm worthy of. Verse 16, he says, who am I, O Lord God? And what is mine house that thou hast brought me hither to? This is the end of his life. And he's, he's basically reflecting on his life and looking back in retrospect. And he's saying, who am I? Of course, this is after God gives him the promise that his child is going to build, you know, of his seed is going to build the temple and he's going to be a king and reign forever and ever. It's the sure mercies of David. But he goes on to explain, you know, David that is, that, you know, I'm not worthy of this. This is the end of his life. This is the, you know, David is an old man. He's getting ready to lay up uh, supplies and things for Solomon, his son, to come that's going to build the temple one day. And he still views himself as what? Being a man of low degree. Being a man that's lightly esteemed. Being a poor man and not worthy. After all the feats and all the accomplishments, you know, after all the praise that he had received, after all of the great things that he had accomplished that no man could do, how he built up the kingdom and won so many battles, and was just praised and glorified by everybody. Do you know how he still viewed himself? As a man that's lightly esteemed. As a man of, of low degree. You know what he says? Who am I? Who am I? If you want to be a man that God will use, you must be a humble man. God wants to receive the praise himself. So he's not going to use someone that's going to try to steal all the praise. Do you know what he wants, he wants you to be? He wants you to be a humble man. So the very first point that we can learn about the heart of David in order to be a man after God's own heart is his great humility. And he retained that humility from the beginning of his life to the end of his life. His great humility. The next thing is David's trust in the Lord. I want you to go to 1 Samuel chapter 17. This is the most famous story about David. It is the story of David and Goliath. So this is, this is good to see David before he had ever even began you know, his big mission. Before he had ever even began you know, uh, uh, all of the great, as I said, feats that he will one day accomplish. I want you to look at 1 Samuel chapter number 17. Look at verse number 40. This is as he's about to approach Goliath and fight with him. It says, And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David. And the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, and ruddy, and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog, that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Now watch this. Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air, and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, watch this, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that, that, that there is a God in Israel. Amen. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So Goliath is this massive man. He's this nine foot man. He's huge. The Bible says that he's been a man of war from his youth. He's as skilled as you could possibly be, and he has the size, as I said, the talent, 
and David's going out to fight this man and David just being a youth, David being maybe 17, 18 years old. He's a small man and you know how much experience he has fighting in a war? Zero. None. And I want you to notice that Goliath comes up and approaches David and begins to mock David and to ridicule David and he starts to boast about how he is about to kill David. But notice that he mentions himself repeatedly and that he is going to take David's head. He is going to kill David. He's, he's, he's trusting in his own abilities. Then we see this vast contrast when David begins to speak and David begins to talk about how he's going to win and how he is going to be victorious. And every statement gives glory to God. Every statement just shows that he's not trusting in his own abilities or his own talents. You know what he was doing? He was trusting in the Lord to defeat Goliath. He was not trusting in his own skills. He was not trusting in himself, but he was trusting in the Lord. Now, David showed up and there were a bunch of soldiers from the nation of Israel there, wasn't there? There were tons of them. There were all the whole nation of Israel and all the soldiers of, of the nation of Israel are all there and they're encamped round about the Philistines in the valley, right? I believe of Rephaim. And they're all there and they're about to you know, go to war. They're approaching war and Goliath kept coming out and mocking you know, uh, the God of Israel, mocking Jehovah, wasn't he? Then what happens? They're all shaking in their boots. They're all terrified and scared and fearful of Goliath. Do you know why? Why were they afraid? Because they weren't trusting in the Lord. Because they, you know what they were trusting in? They were trusting in their own abilities. And you know what they were doing? Just like the spies that were, that were uh, afraid to go in and to defeat the Canaanites and the giants, those of, of Anak, do you know what they were doing? They were looking at themselves and their own skills and then they were looking at their enemies and saying, I'm not big enough. I'm not, you know, talented enough. I'm not skilled enough in order to win this fight. But that didn't matter to David. That was what, that was what separated David. So you, want, you say, what made David different than all of the other men of God in the Old Testament? What made David different than all the other prophets? What made him a man after God's own heart? His great humility. What made David a man that was different than all of the other men that were there of the soldiers of the Israelites? Why did he go forth and defeat Goliath and no one else did? Because they were trusting in their own abilities and themselves and he was trusting in the Lord. That was what enabled David to be able to defeat Goliath. That was what made David a man after God's own heart because he sought the things of God. Look at what it says one more time. I want you to look with me at... Verse 45, Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. That's what Goliath is trusting in. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Now David right now, I don't know if you've thought about this, but he is, he is alluding to the fact that Goliath has all of this armor that David does not have. <coughs> Excuse me. Goliath is coming with a sword and with a spear and he has all these things. The Bible records that for you right before this. And he has a shield. And David's saying, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Or I believe that's how he words it. In the name of the Lord of hosts. Do you know what he's pointing out? I don't have everything that you have. Do you know why? Because I don't need it. Because I'm coming in the name of the Lord. Because I'm coming in the name of God. He says, in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Then he says, this day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand. Notice, the Lord will deliver thee into mine hand. And I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Now, why is David doing all of this? I want you to notice what... What David wants to bring about by this victory. He says this, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Does he say that all the earth may know that David is a mighty soldier? That all the earth may know that David, this young man, was talented or skilled enough in warfare to defeat the well-known, the infamous giant Goliath. No, he, you know what he wanted? Was he wanted God to receive praise from this. Do you know what he was trusting in? He's trusting in the Lord. He wasn't trusting in himself. Look at verse 47. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord, watch this, saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our 
hands. Why was David a man after God's own heart? Because he sought the things of God. He sought to trust in the Lord. I want you to go to Psalm chapter number 118, verse number 8. He sought to trust in the Lord in every area of his life. He didn't, he didn't lean upon his own flesh or upon his, his own hands or upon his own might. He trusted in God. He had a great trust in God that other people did not have. He was able to trust the Lord in all areas of his life, even when he's facing a giant. Even when he's in a point in his life where you know, you know, things are not looking up, he's going through problems, trials, whatever it may be, he trusted in God. And we, of course, should do the same thing. Look at Psalm chapter number 118, verse number 8. Psalm chapter number 118, verse number 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. I want you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter number 12. 2 Samuel chapter number 12. The third point that set David apart from many other men of God in the Bible is that David acknowledged his sin. David acknowledged his sin. Now, other men in the Bible would acknowledge their sin from time to time. But there's never a time recorded in the Bible where David sins and someone comes to him and corrects him, reproves him, whatever you want to refer to it as, rebukes him, and he does not receive it. Every time that David is rebuked in the Bible, he receives correction. There's a time with Nathan, there's a time with Joab, when Joab comes to him about what he had done to Absalom. Every time in the Bible that David sins, that I'm aware of, David receives correction. And not only does he receive the correction, he acknowledges his sin. And every time, not only does he acknowledge his sin, he also, in addition to that, because these are not the same things, he repents of his sin. He turns from his sin. Of course, that's not for salvation or anything along those lines. He, as a Christian, he's already saved. He's trusting in the Lord. He is told of his sin. He acknowledges that he has sin. And then he turns from that sin and ceases to walk in it and commit it. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 12. I want you to look with me at verse number 13. The Bible says, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Notice, notice the words that David says. Nathan came to him and he drew an analogy, of course, with the sheep. And you're familiar with the story. And if you're not, too bad. He comes there and he had committed adultery and he draws an analogy with a, a poor man and a rich man and how this works out and how it's similar unto David committing adultery with Uriah's wife Bathsheba. And he has all these wives, but he's not satisfied with it and he stole Uriah's wife. And he, he, he uh, you know, uh, uses an analogy, this story or a parable to help David to see his own flaw. And then Nathan says to him, Behold, thou art the man. Thou art the man. He bluntly corrects him and rebukes David. And you know what David's response was when he had sinned? David says in verse number 13, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. David was a man that was willing to admit his sin. He was a man that was willing to acknowledge his sin. This also, <coughs> excuse me, ties in with humility. But it doesn't end there. You need to go forward with that and you need to actually respond and be a person that is willing to acknowledge your sin. You will stay the same Christian at the same growth as you are today if you are unwilling to acknowledge your sin. You have sin in your life. Every person in here has sin in your life. However young, however old that you are, you have sin in your life. You have problems that you commit. And, and, and different types of things that you struggle with in your life and you're never going to be perfect and you're going to continue to have sin in your life. But if you are unwilling to acknowledge those sins and to admit that you're a sinner and that you're struggling in these areas and when you maybe you know, uh, have a flaw or a fault, if you're unwilling to admit that, you're not going to grow. Because you know what you can do? The first step of acknowledging your sin, is the next step is correcting it. The first step is acknowledging it. The next step is fixing it. The next step is turning from it. If you don't admit or acknowledge your sin, you're never going to correct the problem. So David was a man that's different than a lot of the men in the Old Testament in that he was willing to acknowledge his sin. Saul acknowledges his sin a couple of times. But Saul gets to a point where he stops acknowledging his sin. That's the difference between Saul and David. Saul acknowledged his sin. He acknowledged his sin to David. But Saul got to a point where he no longer acknowledged his sin. He was going down this downward spiral where there was times when he wasn't acknowledging his sin and he would continue on. But there were times where he would. David, there's not a single time in the Bible. You need to be a man like David that will acknowledge your sin. 
that will realize and, and do some introspect on yourself and, and, and realize the sin that's in your life and when it's pointed out, if the preacher preaches on it, if somebody points it out to you, you need to be a person that will acknowledge your sin, admit the sin, and go forward and correct it and fix it. That was the man that David was. I want you to look now with me at Psalm chapter number 41. This is David writing. See, David did this again. Psalm chapter number 41. <clears throat> See, these types of sermons may not be the most interesting and they may not be the, the, the most flowery and, and things along those lines, but they're the most beneficial to you. They're the most, uh, 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 you know, uh, they're the best sermons for you. Because they will be able to help you in your lives. These types of practical sermons are the ones you can actually take and apply and you can and use it as a mirror and look at yourself and we can look at the things. I mean, we're given a man that God says, hey, that's a man after my heart. And then we're told so much about that person. We're given so many you know, characteristics of him, so many stories and the way that he responds and the way that he reacts. And not only that, the way that he corresponds with the Lord and how the Lord views him and what, you know, how the Lord responds back to him. I mean, you're told so much about David, who is, who is a man, called a man, and has the testimony from the Lord of being a man after God's own heart. We need to study the heart of David. And we need to look at the things that David did and try to mimic those things that was pleasing to God. I want to be a man after God's own heart. It's not impossible to also be a man that's, you know, a, a man after God's own heart as well, for you as well. You could be just as great a man or better than David. There aren't these certain limitations now later on, you know, as history goes on or because you're not a part of the nation of Israel or all these things. You know, we, you today could become a man. If you are not already, you could be a man after God's own heart. So study these things out. And these are, these are the important types of sermons that can really, they're more, they can be more significant and more impactful for you in your life. So he acknowledged his sin. Look at Psalm chapter number 41 verse 4. It says, And I said, Lord... Be merciful unto me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. That's powerful wording. Do you ever pray to God and actually say, Be merciful to me, Lord, for I have sinned against thee. Maybe that will help you do introspect and see, like, I don't do that often. You know what? I'm not willing. And you know why it sounds, it sounds strong or it sounds hard? is because it's, it's filled with humility again. You know, trusting in the Lord, that's why I, the very first point I started off with great humility, because these... A lot of these next points, all of these next points actually, I'm just kind of checking the last one. All of these points that follow, the three points that follow, they all are predicated or built upon the foundation of humility. That's where they all begin. And what a humble statement that is for him to acknowledge his sin in those you know, uh, uncertain terms and words. In those clear words where he says, Be merciful unto me, Lord. He says, Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. You should pray to God. And ask for mercy from the Lord when you sin against Him. You should, God is, uh, uh, you should ask for mercy because He'll give you mercy. If you don't pray and ask for things, God's not going to give them to you. You know, the Bible talks about you know, that you have not because you ask not. So God may have showed you mercy in a certain situation in your life, but you just didn't pray for it and ask for it. So number one, this is kind of a side note in addition to that. You should pray for mercy for God when you sin against Him because you're going to sin against Him. No one's perfect. And you know what you should do is you should acknowledge your sin before God. You should tell Him, I have sinned against you. It'd be good for you to grow in humility as well. This would help you grow and become more of a humble person. Because that's what we should seek after is having a humble heart. And you should acknowledge your sin. And once you acknowledge it and you speak it and you say it even aloud or just in your mind praying to the Lord, it will help you to have a turning point to where you can begin to correct those issues in your life. That sin, uh, maybe it's a particular sin in your life. Look at Psalm chapter 51, verse 4. Just 10 chapters forward, but the same verse. Psalm chapter 51, verse 4, it says, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be judge, justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. So notice again, he prays to God, he says, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. He acknowledges his sin. Not only did it, it didn't end with acknowledgement, it, it, he, it followed afterwards with a repentance where he would repent of his sin, an actual turning of the sin, a physical turning and you know, putting it to works. I want you to go now to 1 Samuel chapter number 24. 1 Samuel chapter number 24, and this is going to be a segue into the last point. 
1 Samuel chapter number 24. <clears throat> this is where Saul is covering his feet in the cave. It means he's sleeping and, and David approaches unto him. David was uh, in the cave already. Saul comes in and uh, David approaches unto him and he cuts off just a part of his skirt. That's his robe. 1 Samuel chapter 24, look at verse number 1. And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines that he was told, <clears throat> that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheepcoats by the way where was a cave. And Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him, because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord the King! And when Saul looked behind him, look at this, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. So you see the great humility there? We saw the humility when his heart smote him there uh, in verse 6. And how he spoke, he said, The Lord's anointed. He referred to him as my master. And how can I stretch forth my hand of the Lord's anointed? And notice that his heart smote him. What did he do? Even to himself, what did he do? He acknowledged his sin. He had a, a clear conscience. He had a good conscience. You know what he did? It made him guilty and he responded to it. And he acknowledged it even to himself. And you know what else he did? He fixed it. He didn't go forward with you know, uh, the deeds that he was about to do. And we see his humility again. That was point one. Keep reading there. Look at... Uh, uh, verse 10. We can just read verse 10. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord had delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave, and some bade me kill thee, but mine eye spared thee. And I said I would not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. He calls him his Lord, meaning his master again, or his boss. This is point four. It's David's forgiveness and mercy. David's forgiveness and mercy. Now, this... There is no one that's even close to David when it comes to this category. The, the, the great mercy that David showed to people, specifically people that had done him wrong, and the great forgiveness that David was willing to extend to people that had betrayed him and were his enemies and had done him wrong, cannot, it's not, not only can anyone even come close, you know, not only has anyone surpassed his mercy and his forgiveness, but no one's even close. David is by far the greatest example. And really, it's hard to find other examples in the Bible of people loving their enemies. Where they're truly being a, a great example, and it's detailed information of where they go so far, and you would say, man, they really love their enemies. Not only were they not mean to their enemies, not only did they not avenge themselves, but David loved his enemy. And here's an example where Saul is literally trying to slay David. The purpose that Saul was out in the wilderness and in En Gedi in the first place was to kill David. That's why he was there. Do you know why he was sleeping? Because he's tired from his journey that he was on to try to find and kill David. That's why he was in the cave. And David has such a right heart that when he goes in and cuts off the skirt of Saul's robe privily, that it says that his heart smote him and that he felt bad about what he had done. And he acknowledged his sin to himself and he repented of it and he knew I shouldn't do this. And then he's referring to Saul even within his own heart as master. He's the Lord's anointed. I shouldn't have done this. Then when Saul rises up after he awakes and he, he, he walks out, David follows him out and David literally bows down before Saul calling him Lord after Saul literally is, is he's sleeping in there. Because he's tired from his journey that he's on to try to find and kill David. And David is sincere as all get out. Can you imagine that? He's bowing down before the man that's trying to find him and kill him because he feels bad that he had just cut off his skirt. The skirt of his robe, that is. He's bowing down to him. There is no example of any man even close to that in the Bible. But do you know what David is referred to as? A man after God's own heart. 
I want you to look with me. Keep your hand here, actually, but go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. We're going to see God Himself teaching and telling us to have a heart like David, to love our enemies. Look at Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 44. Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 44. The Bible says, <clears throat> look at verse 43 first. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. you know, and, and what do you see David doing? In just that. This is God speaking and telling you, hey, this is what you should do. These would be the right things that you should do. In Matthew 5, 44. That's him. The Beatitudes. This is how you should live your life. These are the things that you should do. This is what God desires. This is God's will, right? And we see David doing just that. Being a man after, you know, God's own heart. What does he do? He loves his enemies. When Saul's trying to kill him. David is, is uh, and, and just like with humility, David does this same thing all throughout his life. I want you to go with me now to, go to uh, 1 Samuel chapter number, I'm sorry, 2 Samuel chapter number 16. Now we looked at this. <clears throat> but uh, we didn't focus specifically on this virtue of David. 2 Samuel chapter number 16, look at verse number 5. The Bible says, When King David came to Behurim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still as he came. And he cast stones at David. And at all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man. And thou man of Belial, the Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. This is David fleeing from the rebellion of Absalom when he had conspired to take over the kingdom. Then said Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog, why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. And the king said, What have I to do with thee, ye sons of Zeruiah? So let him curse. Because the Lord hath said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone, and let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. So this, this guy is literally throwing stones and rocks at them. I mean, he's just casting stones. I'm sure he's hitting David. I mean, he's throwing them. I mean, he, you know, at least some of them are pegging him, right? So he's throwing rocks and throwing stones and hitting David and cursing David and saying he's a bloody man and he's a man of the devil, of Belial, he says. He's a bloody man and, and that God has done this to him and he's being punished by the Lord and he just keeps throwing stones and he's just cursing David. You know, go to hell, David, you wicked, evil man, you bloody man, you're a child of the devil. I mean, you've got to put this into perspective. It's horrible. And the sons of Zeruiah are always out of control. And they're, you know, right here, they're saying, hey, let me, let me, you know, go up and take his head off, right? It's like, uh, you know, the one time where Saul's sleeping, and again, David has to, you know, pull the reins back on, on uh, uh, Abishai, I believe it is. He's like, let me smite him once. And I'll only smite him once. I won't have to do it twice. I'll kill him with one. That's what he's saying. And he's like, no, 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 just take the cruise and the spear, you know, and we're good. Calm down, man. You know, that's how they are constantly. You know, uh, but he's, they're, they're, they're saying, hey, let me kill him. Let me just take his, his head off, this dead dog. And David's like, let him curse. He's like, my son's already taken my kingdom from me. My own son has betrayed me. He's like, and how much, you know, what is that? What he's saying is this. What is what he's doing compared to what's going on in my life right now with Absalom, my, my son that I love stealing my kingdom? You think that's what I'm worried about? That's his point. Let him curse. God, let him curse. Let him curse. Could he have told the sons of Zeruiah to go up there and kill this guy? Would have anything happened? No. Nothing would have happened. He could have told him and nothing would have happened. That wasn't going to slow him down or cause him to get caught or anything like that. They could have went up there and killed him immediately. But you know what he said? Let him curse. Let him do it. Let him curse. Go to 
Uh, 2 Samuel chapter number 18. There's many other examples of this. Many, many other examples where he, people betray him and he has the right heart. You know, Joab betrays him once. Uh, Ahithophel uh, uh, betrays him. He's betrayed repeatedly. Obviously, the worst uh, uh, betrayal is Saul and then his son. And I would say probably his own flesh and blood would be worse. That would be the hardest thing to go through. Is your own son trying to literally kill you. Your, your father-in-law is not, that, not as bad. I was going to say it's not that big a deal. It's a pretty big deal. But it's not near as bad as your own flesh and blood, your own son that you raised, turning against you, stealing the kingdom, and, and he, he, is, he was literally sending troops and uh, 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 you know, soldiers to kill him. Absalom wanted to kill David. Now I want you to look how, at how David acts here in 2 Samuel chapter number 18. Look at verse number 32, the end of the chapter. And the king said unto Cushai, Is the young man Absalom safe? And Cushai answered, The enemies of my lord the king and all that rise against thee to do thee hurt be as that young man is. And the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went... Thus he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom. And then watch what he says. Would God I had died for thee. O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Absalom just stole the kingdom from him. Absalom just had him running out. And, and he's an old man at this time. He's older because remember the soldiers told him like, Hey, you're getting older. We don't want you to go forth into battle. So he's an older man. I mean, David could have been in his 60s at this time. He's an old, gray-headed man, and his own son is stealing the kingdom from him after David had only done good to him. After Absalom had killed a man, David didn't have him put to death, which he should have been put to death for murder. David called Absalom back to the kingdom. He called him back and allowed him to come back to Judah and then also invited him back into the kingdom itself. And then Absalom turned on him. And tried to kill him, sent forth an army to kill him. And you know what David said? Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son. And he said this, would God I had died for thee. And it's interesting, too, because what is David? What, what was God seeking? A man after his own heart. A man that would be like him. And you know, what's going on here is Absalom is God's enemy. Right? Or I'm sorry, Absalom is David's enemy. Right? Why don't you go to Romans chapter number 5. Romans chapter number 5. He was truly a man after God's own heart because God had the exact same attitude where God was willing to, to die and to give his own life and to sacrifice his own lives for his enemies. Look at Romans chapter number 5. Look at verse number 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now look at verse 10. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So what does it say that, that we were? We were enemies of God. We were enemies of God. And you know what God was willing to do for us? God was willing to give his own life for us. He's willing to give, of course, the Son of God died for, of course, that's, you know, the man Christ Jesus. And, and you know, there's the distinction there, but there's also the unity of God himself dying. Right? You know, just like the picture of Isaac being offered. And what does, what does Abraham say to Isaac? He says that God will provide himself a lamb. And what does that mean? Well, God provides the lamb, yes. He provided the Son of God, but God also was willing himself. God provided himself as the lamb. Right? You know what David said? He said, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee. It's a great picture of God. We can see God's heart. We can see David having a heart after God. Being a man after God's own heart. And the great forgiveness that he was willing to extend to Absalom. I mean, it doesn't get much worse than your own son trying to kill you and steal your kingdom and everything that you have. It doesn't get much worse for that. And David, even when he had done that and when Absalom was dead, he says, I wish I would have died instead of Absalom. You can't find anybody that tops that. You can't find anybody in the Bible that has that much mercy and that much forgiveness in the Bible. 
And it comes from, as I said, from what the whole sermon was predicated upon. It was all founded upon what? Humility. Having this humble heart. That's where it all begins. David was truly a man after God's own heart. You can see, you can see Jesus Christ forgiving his enemies. We can find God doing all these things. You know, obviously God doesn't have sin, you know, so he, didn't, he, he, he doesn't have sin to acknowledge. But we see Jesus Christ trusting in the Lord. We can see him doing that just like David did. And we can see Jesus Christ portraying uh, uh, or uh, uh, performing great humility while he was on the earth, didn't he? He humbled himself, the Bible says in Philippians 2. You can see he's truly a man after God's own heart. He desired the things that God desires. He has, you know, his will was in line with the will of God. And these are four major characteristics that set David apart from other great men of God. Not only does it set them apart to make them, you know, a good man. That's not what I'm saying. These are four major characteristics that he excelled in, that in, in, in ways that no other man in the Bible excelled which I believe qualified him to be, and I'm sure there were more, but I believe that these four things are very prominent things that he did that qualified him to be a, uh, a man after God's own heart, to be referred to as a man after God's own heart. You know what we see here, one more time, with the last point was what? David's great mercy and David's great forgiveness. We, as Christians, should be people that are willing to forgive even our enemies. Even those that are enemies. We see men in the New Testament doing this. Being beaten, being persecuted. We see the Lord on the cross. We see all different people throughout the Bible being willing to do this. We as Christians should be men that are, and women that are willing to forgive our enemies. We should be merciful to other people. We should be willing to, you know, to the point of giving our own lives for other people. Being, we should be forgiving to others. When they do us wrong, you shouldn't just you know, hold, hold something against somebody and, and always trying to settle the score and always trying to you know, make sure that we're on a level playing field or being even with other people. Every time somebody does you wrong, you're just holding it against that person and looking for the opportunity to get them back. You know what you should do? You should have a heart where you're willing to forgive them and you're ready to forgive them. That's the heart of a Christian. You know, this may be the boring part. This may be the, the, the part about Christianity that people don't like. But you know what else it is? It's the hard part about Christianity. No other religion teaches this. You can't find this in Islam. You can't find this in other religions. And it's the thing about Christianity that even Christians don't practice. You know why? Because it's difficult. That's why. Because it's hard. We should be people that are willing to forgive our enemies. Amen. When people are persecuting you and mocking you, you should have the heart that you'd be willing to forgive them at any moment. If they came to you and they asked for forgiveness, of course there are stipulations of forgiveness. Totally different subject. There's a way to reconcile things and people can't just do you wrong and then, you know, and you just ignore it and continue in a relationship with that person. But if that person comes to you and says, please forgive me, I've done you wrong. Even if they became your enemy, it doesn't matter how bad it is, you should be willing to forgive that person. That's one of the major things. And I want to end on that because it, it is probably the hardest thing of all the things that I just mentioned there to excel unto. So it starts with humility. That's where it starts. Point number one. Point number two, trust in the Lord in every area of your life. For finances, for whatever it may be. Every area of your life. Point number three, acknowledge your sin. Because that's going to help you to fix the sin and to purge the sin from your life. Point number four. Be a man or a woman of great mercy and great forgiveness, even unto your enemies. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for being uh, the greatest example of, of course, Jesus Christ. But we also are thankful for the other great men of God throughout the Bible. And we're thankful for... You recording and giving us their lives uh, written down with, uh, with ink on paper to where we can read about it and we can learn from David's life and learn from his great example and the story of his great mercy and his great forgiveness, of his great humility, trusting in the Lord and his humility when he's willing to acknowledge his sin and repent of his sin. We ask you that you'd be with us, dear God. You'd, you'd help us to be Christians that are practical Christians, uh, Christians that are actually growing in our Christian life each day and learning and, 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 and uh, actually putting things into practice and, and changing every day. We're changing and we're, we're growing into the new man. We're growing in the new creature and in Christ every single day. Be with us and bless our church. Uh, we ask you that you would uh, bless all of the prayer requests and be with everyone that showed up this day. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Okay. <clears throat>